Well, thank you very much for this uh, introduction, uh, Jonathan. Can you hear me? Because I heard that apparently the acoustic um, atmosphere is not always optimal, but just give me a sign. If you can't hear me anymore, then I will try to speak louder. So uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, of course, very honored by this invitation to give the recollection uh, lecture. Um, I've heard that this is a more formal uh, speech, so I've prepared a written uh, speech, uh, which is rather <laughs> unusual for me. Uh, so I will read my paper, um, but I will try to do so rather slowly. If I'm going too quickly, just uh, give me a sign as well. Um, so the idea of this paper um, is actually to um, introduce you somehow to the intellectual world behind many of the places that we've been to today. I mean, All Souls College, um, which as Professor Sturks explained us this afternoon, was about praying for the souls of the soldiers who fought in the war uh, with, with the French. Um, it's about this whole idea of yeah, living here in this world, but at the same time also being connected to the other world and making sure that while we live here in this world and make commercial transactions and so on, we can actually save our souls and make sure that we will also have a good afterlife. So this basic idea had a huge impact on the way law developed. And so that is the story I'm going to tell you uh, this afternoon. Uh, what implications this belief in the afterlife had on the development of contract law. So without uh, further ado, let me start. So the concept of Christian contract law uh, comes with a troubled past. The standard part of the first year law experience includes exposure to the notion that moral values and legal rules are to be neatly distinguished from one another. The coercive power of the state, exercised or brandished, makes the difference between the pious hopes of morality and the grim certitudes of law, as Michael Barkin, a political scientist, scientist once summarized the positivistic creed, which is underlying modern legal systems. Even more so, the thought of judges taking into account exclusively religious arguments or of religious authorities enacting rules that are enforceable in courts of law is alien and even hostile to the modern mindset. The separation of church and state, or for that matter, uh, religious beliefs and legal norms, is a fundamental tenet of Western legal systems since the beginning of the 19th century. And as a consequence, the notion that Christianity could have to do anything with law appears now like a contradiction in terms. John Austin, um, one of the most influential theoreticians of legal positivism in the Anglo-Saxon world, allegedly claimed, and I cite him, that an exception, demurrer or plea, founded on the law of God was never heard in a court of justice, from the creation of the world down to the present moment. End of citation. Today, I will nevertheless try to show you that legal, posi legal positivism is not a good guide to understand the historical foundations of Western law, especially in the fields of contracts. So, in the first part, I will give you a kind of a general overview of Christians who uh, try to say something about contract law. Then, secondly, I will focus on one of the aspects of Christian contract doctrine, especially the doctrine of offer and acceptance that has already been mentioned today. And then the third part of my paper will uh, consist of a small case, a small um, specific example of the morality of the marketplace in which like the importance of the liberal understanding of contract that was developed by those Christians um, had an important role to play. So that will be the basic structure of my lecture now in three parts. So the first part, Christians contract law and the morality of the market. So the fact that we have been accustomed to think morality law and religion separately does not mean that Western law does not bear any historical relations to moral and religious culture, quite the contrary. If anything, John Austin would not have had to reject the use of religious arguments in courts so emphatically if his opinion had already been common currency in 19th century Britain. In the passage that I just cited, uh, he was actually obliged, John Austin, to oppose the contrary view advocated by another famous English jurist, William Blackstone. William Blackstone, uh, who was an icon of the British Enlightenment. 
And faithful through a centuries-old tradition in European jurisprudence, Blackstone adhered to the view that the civil laws could be invalidated by contrary natural laws, which he considered as God's dictates. In recent decades, recognition of the religious foundations of Western legal culture, which can still be seen in the work of someone like Blackstone, has received strong impetus by the work of Harold Berman from Harvard University and John Witte, uh, his intellectual here at Emory University Center for the Study of Law and Religion. In the field of contract law in particular, the Christian origins of modern contract law have been laid out in great de detail by James Gordley uh, in his Philosophical Origins of Modern Contract Doctrine, which has also already been mentioned this morning. In a world that was not yet characterized by the modern division between state and church, it were not only the civil lawyers specializing in Roman law or statutory law, but also the experts in canon law, that is the law of the church, eh, who were responsible for shaping contract doctrine along with Christian theologians. While Roman law had a lot to say about specific contracts, such as sale, lease, what it had to offer was a collection of cases and precedents without much in the way of systematic reflection or principles. As Gordley has shown, medieval canon lawyers and scholastic theologians in the 16th and 17th centuries combined the technical vocabulary of Roman law with evangelical principles and Aristotelian Thomistic virtue ethics. As a result, they came up with general principles such as good faith in contracts, the bindingness of naked agreements, the pacta nuda, and the principle of fair bargaining. The medieval and early modern canonists and theologians would not have defined themselves as legal theorists. They were actually very pragmatic in the way they uh, discussed contract law because they were involved in the business of counseling and confessing merchants, bankers, and princes. And as a result, the treatment of contract law in their works cannot be severed from their concern with the morality of the marketplace. The confessors needed to evaluate the righteousness and sinfulness of individual Christians' behavior, especially in day-to-day -day transactions in the marketplace, such as money exchange, commercial loans, credit sales, monopolies, and so on. And to better understand the moral issues involved in those transactions, they analyzed business transactions through the lens of contracts. It offered them a technical framework to determine exactly, with a lot of precision, the rights and the obligations of contracting parties. And it's certainly not a coincidence that one of the first treatises uh, on contracts in the Western legal tradition was written by a monk, by Peter of John Olivi in the 13th century. He was a Franciscan theologian, and he was a counselor uh, at the time of the merchants in the, in the Mediterranean, especially in southern France. He studied with uh, Thomas Aquinas in Paris, uh, but then went on to uh, teach in the Franciscan convent in Narbonne, where he also became one of the principal confessors to the new urban class of prosperous businessmen. Treatises like that of Olivi were only rediscovered quite recently in the 1970s uh, by people like Giovanni Todeschini, yeah, um, who actually discovered that Olivi was a very liberal thinker somehow. It was also discovered then in the 70s and 80s that Olivi's work uh, had been a major uh, source of inspiration of other theologians like Bernardine of Siena or Antonine of Florence, uh, two late medieval theologians whose moral support for the spirit of commercial enterprise was already recognized by Max Weber, Max Weber, Max Weber, who is now known as a sociologist, but who was actually a lawyer and legal historian uh, by training. So in his Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, Bernardine of Siena and Antonine of Florence are uh, mentioned as just two among the more famous uh, medieval theologians who dealt with issues at the crossroads of market morality and contract law. And so ever since, since the 13th, 14th century, there has been this tradition of theologians uh, writing about contracts and the marketplace. And the apotheosis, the acme, so to speak, of this tradition of canon lawyers and theologians thinking about contract law and the morality of the market comes in the 16th and 17th centuries.
um, against the background, of course, of huge societal changes, and especially yeah, the discovery of the Americas, which created a lot of new global trade networks and financial uh, innovations. So in that period, the 16th and the 17th centuries, and we have someone who's very knowledgeable about the Portuguese side of the story in this room, uh, so I will not go into that particular kind of detail, but uh, so Portugal's played, of course, a very important role in this, and, and uh, university, college, Jesuit college in Evora, for instance. Huh? And so while the Catholic theologians uh, in the early modern per period um, started writing very big and voluminous treatises on contracts and on, on, on market transactions, we actually see at the same time kind of a counter-reaction in the Protestant world huh? with jurists like Charles Dumoulin uh, or also here in Oxford, Albert, uh, Alberico Gentili, saying that it's actually not the task of theologians to discuss contracts or commercial transactions. Theologians have to interpret the Bible, but they should not think about such very down-to-earth matters as contracts and morality of the marketplace. So I will emphasize uh, mostly the Catholic side now of the story, but it's important to know that at the same time you have Protestant theologians and jurists who are also uh, rethinking this whole tradition, and um, they are claiming that these subjects should be discussed especially by jurists and less by theologians. So in the early modern period, we saw uh, the publication of literally um, thousands of voluminous treatises of thousands of pages sometimes, sometimes on justice and right, the justitia et jure in Latin, or on contracts, de contractibus, or on restitution, de restitutione. Um, they rolled those treatises from the printing presses uh, across Europe, uh, but especially in Salamanca, in Lyon, um, in Louvain, in Cologne, in Milan, and so on. And so there are a couple of big names that you might have heard of, like uh, Francisco de Vitoria, Domingo de Soto, Luis de Molina, or Leonardo Lessius, mentioned already this morning. Um, but actually, they are only the top of the iceberg. We literally have hundreds of interesting authors who discussed contracts and the morality of the marketplace. So I will uh, stop my more historical introduction here and now focus on uh, one of the things that they discussed in the field of contract law. So a common principle that they inherited from the medieval canon law, those early modern theologians, was the principle pacta sunt servanda, mentioned this morning uh, by Professor Sirk. So the idea that all agreements are binding, even if you are not framing them in formalistic terms, like in the stipulatio mentioned uh, this morning. But what is going to be new in the early modern period is that the theologians will combine this notion of pacta sunt servanda with, uh, well, what they read in Thomas Aquinas and in other theologians about, promise, about promises and promise making. And so in the end, they will develop this uh, whole uh, doctrine of offer and acceptance. And let me just cite what Pedro de Oniate, so a Jesuit mentioned also already by Jonathan uh, this uh, morning, Pedro de Oniate, who was a Jesuit who uh, founded several colleges, Jesuit colleges in uh, what is now Latin America. Um, and some of these colleges are now universities, like the University of Cordoba in Argentina. So that was a, he was a very active and dynamic person. Uh, he became the head of the Jesuit order in Paraguay. Um, he also became a judge and so on. And he wrote a four-volume treatise, like literally this big, on contracts. Really very impressive work. And it's like, it's like the end product of this whole theological tradition of thinking about contracts. So that's why I will cite from his work. So it was uh, published in 1646 in Rome. And so in this, um, in this treatise, when he talks about the definition of contract, eh, he, de he describes contracts in terms of offer and acceptance. And he says, I, I quote him, every binding agreement is composed of promise and acceptance, just as a physical thing is composed of matter and form, or a human being of soul and body. End of the quote. And observing that promise had now also simply become synonymous with contract, he went on to specify, and I quote him, that if promise is understood in the second manner, that is, as a combination of offer and acceptance, then it does not differ from contract, just as a man does not differ from the combination of his soul and body. So, you see, we have talked about these different meanings of contract this morning. Here we get very clearly the idea that what, what is a contract? Well, contract is the meeting of 
offer and acceptance. The principle that all binding agreements are the result of a combination of offer and acceptance became almost universally accepted by the Catholic theologians in the 16th and 17th centuries. And they would later on be quoted also, for instance, by, by natural lawyers in Scandinavia uh, to make this point, or also uh, by, by, by Viscount Stair. Uh, so this was a very influential doctrine. The binding status of specific types of unilateral promises, for instance, offers for public building projects, like mentioned this morning by Professor Sirx, uh, somebody who runs for a public office and promises that he will uh, build a, a theater uh, once he will be elected. Well, those promises, which were known as polycitationes in, 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 in Latin, polycitationes civitate, uh, were considered as unilateral promises, but still binding. And this was considered a very problematical issue. So there were a lot of thorny debates about how to interpret the fact that unilateral promises, polycitationes civitate, were binding, given that now the general principle was that you always needed an acceptance of an offer for that offer, for that promise to become binding. Um, I will not enter into the technical details, but just to give you an example of how these theologians would pick up ideas from the Roman law and try to reinterpret them against their new framework um, of uh, contract law. Um, in the Protestant tradition, we can see that um, theologians like Johann Osiander would then also draw on these ideas by uh, Oniate and offer an acceptance and perpetuate them. Um, here again, I will also not uh, enter into the details. Um, let me just say something about the fact that we have this whole new doctrine of contracts based on promise, but it's not entirely the same as what we see nowadays in present day contract doctrine, where you have Charles Fried, who also developed a whole theory um, about why promises are binding. Um, and he bases that on the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. But here in the 16th and 17th century, of course, Kant had, was not born yet. So, uh, but still we have promise theory of contract. Uh, what they also uh, intensely discussed is, um, of course, the difference between legally binding and morally binding uh, agreements and promises. Um, but in this regard, it's uh, important, I think, to stress that the modern distinction between law and morality is unhelpful in reading the early modern sources. Since the canonists and the theologians conceived of morality in juridical terms in the first place, like if you think of the central notion of conscience for the Catholics in the early modern period, they will consider conscience as a court, literally as a photum, as a court, and the act by which a confessor would absolve the penitent was an actus judicialis, so a judicial act. So this is very different from our modern, I think, Protestant informed notion of conscience, which is very individualistic, very subjective. But that's not the notion that these theologians and canon lawyers uh, adopted. Uh, and they thought that only experts could tell you what uh, you needed to do in order to have a clean conscience. Experts who had insight into like the objective rules uh, that determined uh, the right course of action. It's also important, I think, to stress that these theologians, and co uh, these theologians conceived of contractual obligations in juridical terms, not just in moral terms. And there was a whole debate about whether uh, promises, accepted promises, were binding by virtue of moral duties such as honesty or being faithful to your word, or because really of justice, of, because of legal rights that has been transferred to the promisee. And most of those theologians and canon lawyers would reject the notion that contracts are binding uh, merely because of moral reasons. No, they would say contracts create debt. So they create debt. That means that the promisee can take you to court and enforce your promise. And this is something that uh, Grotius is then going to borrow from, uh, from theologians like Lassius and Domingo de Soto. Huh? The idea that promising is not merely a matter of truth as uh, Lessius said, but of commutative justice. So a very legal approach to contracts. And um, this new doctrine of contract articulated around the notion of promise reached a climax in the treatises on justice and law written by Jesuit theologians in the first half of the 17th century who would also try to explain this new contract doctrine in larger anthropological terms. And here I will cite again Pedro de Oñate. It's a quote that uh, 
Jonathan already mentioned uh, earlier, yeah? but according to Oniate, the whole point of rethinking contract law was about giving back natural liberty to the contracting parties. So this is a term in Latin that we find in his work, yeah? libertas. Yeah? So according to Oniate, free will is the basis of the entire doctrine of contract. Um, and uh, I quote him, he says at some point, liberty has very wisely been restored to the contracting party, to the contracting parties, thanks to canon law, he says, so that whenever the parties want to bind themselves through concluding a contract about their goods, this contract will be recognized by both the civil and the ecclesiastical courts, before which they will bring their case, and it will be upheld as sacrosanct and inviolable, end uh, of the quote. So Onyata's exposition on the enforceability of accepted promises abounds with references to the verb, the Latin verb, well, eh, to will. So the notion of, of, of the will is extremely central to the way in which they will rethink contract law. Onyate and Molina, or Lessius for that matter, also emphasized the connection between the law of goods, property law, and contract law. Really conceiving of contracts as legal instruments to transfer property rights. And because they had a very, um, very um, strong notion of private property, they also had a very liberal notion, very strong notion of contractual liberty. I cite Onyate. He says, man would not be the true and perfect owner of his goods unless he could dispose of them by contractual agreement when he wanted, with whom he wanted, and in whatever way he wanted. So strong property rights necessitated kind of freedom of contract. So you have this whole uh, philosophy here behind legal uh, technical rules of law, which are not apparent directly in the Roman law discussions of contract. But here it's very clear. You can see that new contract doctrine is embedded in much broader notions of of man and of the relationship between man and God. So you can really see the anthropological foundations here of contract. I think that's what makes these authors very interesting for us. We can agree or not or disagree with, with their anthropological framework, but at least it becomes very explicit in their works. Another um, theologian, Gregorio uh, de Valencia, who taught at Ingolstadt, and that's also important to point out because we sometimes have the tendency to restrict this uh, movement to the school of Salamanca, so to Spain, but, well, there's not only Spain, but also Portugal. That was an Iberian phenomenon, but I think it goes even much wider. I mean, this was a phenomenon that you can also see in what is now Italy or what is now, what was the Holy Roman Empire. So you can see it basically everywhere around that uh, time in uh, Europe. So Gregorio de Valencia, who was teaching in Ingolstadt, um, talked about individuals' um, property rights as like the right to love one's own, one, one's own goods. So, jus amandi res proprias, a very strong uh, expression. Uh, Juan de Mariana, you know, known as a political thinker, uh, was a Jesuit famous for his scathing critique of absolutism. Um, was highly suspicious, for instance, of policies in the field of, of, of monetary law, of monetary policies, uh, that were too laxist because he says, well, if the authorities tinker with the value of money, uh, they risk actually violating the property rights of the citizens uh, because monetary debasement, for instance, so creating artificial inflation and, 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 and reducing the value, the real value of your money, of purchasing power, without the consent of the people, that's like taxing the people without their consent. And so that's a kind of a disguised robbery. So just another example of how strong uh, a notion of, of property rights and protection of the individual that these theologians had uh, in the face of potential abuse by, uh, by authorities. The central value of the individual's intent in the theologian's conceptualization of contractual obligation facilitated the emergence of a Christian contract doctrine centered on the notion of the autonomy uh, of the will. But it also raised numerous questions. Some of those questions we have actually already touched upon this morning. For example, what is the status of fictitious promises or contracts in which the underlying intent of the parties is doubtful? If the will of the parties is the ultimate criterion to interpret contracts, judges uh, and confessors may have difficulties 
in upholding a contract to which one of the parties did not want to be bound entirely. And the example they give is an example that Professor Sirx already mentioned this morning. What if a man promised to marry a girl just to be able to have sexual intercourse with her, but actually did not really intend to be bound by his promise? In dealing with this issue, uh, and many similar issues, the theologians developed a so-called reliance theory of promising, arguing that the will was still the main criterion, but that the promisee's reliance on the promiser's declaration should also be protected, and the seed could not be tolerated. I cite Lessius, faith, so fides, and trust, faith in contractual affairs would crumble, he warned, if promisers could free themselves of their obligation simply by saying that they had made a fictitious promise, that their intent had been different. Of course, one thing we have to keep in mind, and this connects to what Professor Sirks told us about like the evidentiary nature of a lot of the discussions about contracts that we find in Roman law, it was very much oriented towards rules of evidence in the court. The perspective, the perspective changes, of course, fundamentally for the theologians because they are judging the behavior of people in the confessional. So the person who has entered into a contract is uh, himself or herself doubting about the morality, about the righteousness of his or her actions, and is telling this openly to the confessor. So the judge here has no problem of evidence because the individual is immediately like directly revealing his or her mind to the confessor. So that is why we can, why the discussions uh, become very different than in the Roman law tradition or in, in, the, in the purely legal tradition where you always have this problem of evidence in the courts. But this is a problem which disappears in a relation between the confessor and the penitent. Uh, because there, at least if the penitent is honest, there is no problem of evidence. So that also explains why you can get more um, uh, discussions about material law, about the substantive uh, side of law, because you are not confronted with these problems of evidence. Another uh, major issue uh, related to this emphasis on the will uh, was changed, the doctrine of changed circumstances. Um, the early modern theologians took the idea from medieval canon law and from Thomas Aquinas uh, that every agreement contains a kind of implicit condition, kind of an implied term, um, a tacit condition, as they call it, the tacida conditio, um, which says that if the circumstances uh, start to differ fundamentally from the moment when the contract was concluded, that then the promiser would no longer be bound by his promise. Uh, that's the whole notion of frustration, uh, uh, also today in, in contract law. And it was this whole theory of the clausula rebus sixtantibus uh, back in the Ius Commune. One of the most radical formulations of these principles was offered by a Jesuit named Manuel de Sa, he was uh, Portuguese, uh, who argued, and I cite him, that in a general obligation, even if strengthened by an oath, those things which you did not intend are not included. And he specified that those things seem to be all the things to which you would not have bound yourself if you had then thought or known about them. So this is very radical uh, because, and possible because of this strong emphasis on the will. So uh, you could say, for instance, that the whole COVID uh, episode was a circumstance you could not have foreseen as a tenant. And so, well, you, have, you had to leave Oxford because all the colleges closed. And so you do no longer want to pay your rent here in Oxford because, well, this is a changed circumstance. We have COVID happening. And if I had known that when concluding my uh, rent contract, then I would never have wanted to conclude it in the first place. So if you put only the emphasis on the will, this is the kind of problems that you can get um, uh, exposed to. Leonardus Lessius, so one of these Jesuits who was working in the Low Countries, explained that the will does not cover what is unknown concluding that ignorance about a future change in circumstances could be considered as a kind of a mistake that had vitiated the contract from the beginning. And even Oniate, who went further than anyone else in advocating the autonomy uh, theory of contract, considered the principle of changed circumstances as a universally applicable principle and the supreme expression of a higher value that he took already from Aristotelian virtue ethics, namely epikeia uh, of equity. 
I cite him, just as under those changing circumstances, epikeia is to be applied to the laws and constitutions of the princes, so will it be equitable to apply epikeia to the promises made by private persons. For promises are like laws, which private persons impose upon themselves. This is not a notion that I will not go into, but that's very interesting. These theologians started reasoning or thinking contract by analogy with laws. And even though there are precedents for that in some of the case law surrounding uh, locatio conductio in Roman law, they really systematically tried to think all the consequences of making that parallel between laws and um, contracts. So this, con this doctrine of implied terms or changed circumstances was, of course, as it is today, a threat to another very important notion, even more so today than it was back then, of legal security, of stability, of contractual relationships. And this issue was addressed at some point uh, by a theologian named Juan de Lugo. Juan de Lugo, who went on to become a cardinal, um, he is also responsible for the introduction of um, cocaine-like substances in Europe because he was uh, also a medical expert uh, in, when, when he went to Latin America. But Juan de Lugo also wrote a treatise on justice and right, De Justitia et Jure, published in 1642. And in that treatise, at some point, he also discusses, discusses this notion of uh, conditio tacita in all uh, contracts. And he is very skeptical about that. Um, and um, he is skeptical about that precisely because it uh, harms business interests, he says, and because it is a violation of the securitas contractuum, the security, the stability of contracts. So a very modern notion somehow, which we find here in the middle of the 17th century in the work of Juan de Lugo. This is, of course, going to become a central notion in the 19th and 20th century doctrines of contract, security of contract, and that's one of the reasons that very few modern legal systems accept uh, this doctrine of uh, frustration or the clausula rebus extantibus. Of course, it is also interesting to note that the whole concept of law has also changed in the meantime. Uh, law is now also absolute. Uh, it's not supposed to be interpreted in an equitable way necessarily. It just binds always and everywhere. That's the positivistic concept of law. And at the same time, we have a more absolutistic interpretation, I would say, also of the bindingness of contracts. Uh, Lugo also um, discussed uh, in a very interesting way another uh, point of discussion among the theologians and the canon lawyers that was to do with their Christian faith, and, and notably with the fact that, of course, in the Lord's Prayer, we read, or we pray every day several times, that we have to forgive uh, uh, the debts to other people. So this notion of debt was interpreted in a very contractual sense. So did we have to, yeah, stop enforcing our promises because Christ asked us to forgive other people's debts? Um, the early modern theologians said, no, that's not what Christ meant. Um, there is no such a thing as a general uh, obligation to uh, forgive you know, your uh, debtors. Um, they ruled out that debt cancellation would even be the right course of action when confronted with um, debtors who had difficulties to pay back uh, a loan, for instance. They said, no, you have to respect pacta sunt servanda, that's the main rule. And if there is really a risk that your debtor, for instance, obliges uh, his son to go and steal in order to pay back his loan, or uh, another example they give is that they start prostituting their own daughters to make sure that they can pay back their loans. Well, in that case, there is a kind of a spiritual risk here, a spiritual danger, and that is a cause for, um, well, interpreting the contractual obligation in a more flexible way, not by counseling the debt, but by according what they called dilatio debiti, so a kind of um, deferral of repayment. So that was for them the right solution to a situation of, of distress, of you know, a situation in which one of the parties was also weaker and was no longer able to uh, pay back a loan, for instance, uh, unless you know, by uh, stealing or by engaging in all kinds of illicit activities. Or also, and that's where you see that that was still a status society back then, if, for instance, a nobleman would have been obliged to start doing um, manorial work, working um, as a plumber or something, to start getting more money to pay back his loans, well, that was also a danger that needed to be avoided. So in that case, you would have to grant to this 
nobleman debtor, you would have to grant uh, extension of payment. But you see, all these Christian ideas are going to have a very uh, concrete impact on the discussions about the bindingness of contracts. Um, A second important principle, besides uh, the idea that contracts are based on the will, is a notion that is, in principle for us, like exactly the opposite of that principle, and that is the emphasis on fairness in exchange, on yeah, justitia commutativa, to use Thomas Aquinas, his term. And, and this is, of course, um, something that is uh, counterintuitive to us. In the, 19th, 20th century um, conception of well-based theories of contract, um, we would rather think of um, expressions such as that of uh, Justice Story, the American judge, uh, who, who said that whether bargains are wise and discreet or profitable or unprofitable or, uh, or um, yeah, conscionable or unconscionable are considerations not for cards of justice, but for the parties themselves to deliver, deliberate upon. So that's, that's the will paradigm today of contract, and it is very different from the theories of the autonomy of the will in the uh, early modern scholastic discussions. Um, you can also see this more modern version of the will theory uh, in someone like Fred Frederick Pollock, huh? um, who said yeah, the notion of justice in exchange is incompatible with the whole doctrine of uh, freedom of contract and the will-centered uh, theory of contract. But in Christian contract doctrine, this opposition is a false one. It's a false one um, because they say, well, we have to understand the liberty of the will in a proper way. In creating private laws and creating contracts, individuals still remain subject to higher laws, so they create those private laws, but those private laws are like part of a higher universe, a broader universe of laws, in which you also have laws laid down by the authorities in the interest of the common good. And the individual has to respect laws laid down uh, for the common good that can restrict and can limit the liberty uh, of the individuals. So this is something um, that is alien to the modern mindset, but that was just normal for the early modern theologians um, because they uh, were living, they were steeped in the tradition of Aristotelian Thomistic thought, eh, which considered uh, man as a doion politicon, eh, as an animal sociale, and so um, man always remained subject to the natural law principle of justice and exchange because God had created man with a rational and social nature, and so therefore his own liberty of contract could be limited by the authorities and uh, also by higher moral norms such as the principle of justice, of fairness in exchange, the principle of fair bargaining. A good illustration of the unproblematic uh, coexistence of principles of contractual freedom and fairness in exchange can be found again in Oniata's work. While praising the fact that canon law and theology had restored freedom to the contracting parties, he also recalled the moral embeddedness of bargaining, and I cite him. Natural law, he says, ordered that natural equity be observed in contracts. It prescribes not only that you should not do unto others what you would not have them do unto you, but also that equilibrium be observed between the object of the exchanges, as is required by commutative justice. So here, again, every single word, I mean, could be the subject of uh, a lecture on its own. Um, I'm not going to do that, but this is a whole reference to the notion of uh, justum pretium or pretium aequale, uh, so the doctrine of just pricing, the doctrine of just pricing or fair pricing. So in Latin, uh, it needs to be recalled, uh, they did not only talk about pretium justum, but about pretium aequale, so this was a direct reference to yeah, prices that could guarantee that in a contractual relationship the equalitas, yeah, the equilibrium, would be respected. So contracts were conceived of as uh, instruments for the well-being of all the parties involved in that contract. So the idea of zero-sum games was impossible for the theologians. It could not be that a contract 
ad was advantageous to one party while uh, being at the expense of the other. That was a contradiction in terms because they said contracts have been invented like it's a matter of use gentium for the benefit for the benefit for the utilitas for the utility for the usefulness of all the parties involved. So that's why they were against uh, uh, gross uh, disparity. But on the other hand, this idea of uh, e equalization, so to speak, um, should not be mistaken huh, for the theory that all goods have a kind of a metaphysical value. That is not what the early modern classics were saying, contrary to what many 19th and 20th century jurists have tried to anachronistically um, project into those uh, early modern and also medieval sources. That's not what the just price doctrine is saying. Huh? Um, it does not kind of refer either to a so-called labor theory of value, which holds that the just price should reflect the labor which an individual seller suffered to um, bring his goods on the market. The just price was simply uh, the price that signaled a balanced or um, fair transaction. And one of the clearest expressions of that, uh, and of that market-friendly nature somehow, of the concept of just pricing can be found in the work of a very famous a Spanish canon lawyer, Diego de Covarrubias y Leyva. I don't know if you've had the chance of visiting the Escorial, the palace of uh, King Philip II, um, but if you visit that uh, palace, uh, so it's just west of Madrid, you actually can see that um, the office of Covarrubias, Diego de Covarrubias, was very close to that of uh, King Philip II, so he was a major counselor to uh, the king at the time, and Diego de Covarrubias uh, was very much influenced by um, the school of Salamanca, and so also discussed this whole theory of, of just pricing, but he explained at the same time uh, um, that the just price did not depend on considering the ontological nature of a merchandise or on the expenses which the merchant had incurred. He said, huh, the just price uh, does not consist in one specific price, it rather covers a broad range of prices that reflect the merchandise utility according to the common estimation in the market. The common estimation in the market, even, he says, etiam si insana sit, even if that uh, estimation in the market seems to be completely absurd and insane, like, which we see now in the housing market, like even if for a very small apartment you have to pay millions and millions of pounds, well, apparently if that's the common estimation of the people who know something about that market, then you have to accept it. It's not necessarily an unjust price. So, Kobarubias and the other scholastics, they actually considered the market as a place of perpetual contest and competition. So they used the term uh, kertamen. You can already see it in the work of John Mayer, uh, the Scottish uh, theologian who, uh, who also taught in Paris and who was a major source of influence for the, the, the theologians working then later in, in Spain and Portugal and the Holy Roman Empire and Italy and so on. Um, John Mayer literally said, well, businessmen are engaged in a contest, in a kertamen, and so they have to take care of their own interest. And one of the ways in which they can do so is by speculating on different prices for one and the same good in different places. That's just part of the game. Uh, that does not mean that if uh, the same good is sold in another place for far less money that this is unjust. No, it's actually part of the game and it's part of the art of a good businessman to be able to anticipate such changes in prices in time and uh, in space. Another observation uh, that I would like to make about doctrine of just pricing is that it served very practical interests. So this is not about metaphysics. It provided confessors uh, criterion, uh, just like uh, judges in the external courts eh, could be able to rely on the prudentes, on the, on the, on the council of, of, of um, homines prudentes who had experience in a specific field, well, it provided confessors with a yardstick, with a criterion to assess the justice of transactions in the marketplace. And so they would accept that there was a whole latitude, a whole margin of different just prices for one and the same good. Once they had established what a just price was, the confessor could determine if there had been a gross violation of that just price or not. And if there had been a gross violation, then he would, he would, um, he would ask, he would demand his penitent to make restitution. So this is really a very central term in this early modern discussion, restitu restitutio. And now it has become part of the doctrine of unjust enrichment and restitution, but 
it had a very technical significance, this word uh, restitutio at the time. Restitutio was an act through which you could rebalance, rebalance a relationship that was no longer equal, in which this equalitas notion reaching back to Aristotle had been uh, violated. So that was the whole idea of restitutio. Restitutio is a way of making sure that commutative justice can be uh, respected again. And so uh, this restitution was very important for the Catholic uh, theologians because they had read in, um, in a letter by St. Augustine uh, that no salvation of souls, that no forgiveness was possible of any form of theft unless restitution had been made. So this is an extremely influential uh, sentence that was taken from a letter by St. Augustine to, to Macedo, uh, which is the, the whole basis of um, yeah, theologians' engagement actually with contract law and market transactions. Um, as the first Roman Catholic catechism from 1566 um, explained, Confessors could not absolve the penitent unless restitution was made of the harm caused by the penitent um, through all kinds of forms of violation of equalitas. For instance, also by exploiting a dominant position. I think Jeff Bezos is coming very clear, uh, very close to that kind of position. Uh, by charging excessive interests, for instance, would also be considered as problematic. And then um, that's why we have all these very nice churches in Florence, because the, the confessors told to the Medici bankers, well, beware, if you want to be sure about the salvation of your soul in the afterlife, you're going to have to make restitution. And if you don't know exactly anymore um, uh, who, who paid too many uh, interests to you, then you have to make restitution to, to the bonum comune, to the public as a whole, or for instance, by giving to the bishop or to the church. That's the way of making restitution. So, and this was not, I mean, this is not theory, this is very practical and you can see the architectural impact of it uh, in many places uh, in the world. I mean, you can even see it in all souls to a certain extent. Um, very interesting in, in this regard is that, of course, for the Protestants in the 16th and 17th century, the idea that you can do anything yeah, to guarantee the salvation of your soul became problematic, as we have also already seen this morning. Um, it cannot be done by your own efforts or your own acts in the radical interpretation of it, of course. Um, and what we see in Protestant theologians, like Osiander and so on, is um, a general disappearance of this whole importance of restitutio in discussions about contract, because it doesn't make sense anymore. And it is replaced by a more, let's say, uh, moralistic discourse in the modern sense of the word, um, in the sense that they will rethink contract law on the basis of the notion of charity. They will say like, you know, in contracts you have to be charitable. Uh, so if you are, for instance, the owner of uh, real estate and you, you rent part of that property to, yeah, to, to vulnerable persons, um, yeah, you should respect the principle of charity and take that into account and um, charge a lower rent, for instance. So, but it's a much vaguer notion, this notion of charity. It's a much vaguer notion um, that you see in, in the Protestant tradition. Uh, Paul Astori has um, investigated this. I, I will not go into the details here uh, tonight. But it's interesting to see that because of changes in theology, you also get changes in the way uh, contract law is being discussed and uh, more specifically the disappearance of this whole doctrine of restitution. So I finally come to the marketplace, and I will just give you one uh, example uh, that shows you why freedom of contract is important, because you might wonder why is that important that you rethink contract in terms of offer and acceptance, and that you uh, start from this notion that everybody is free to enter into the contract of his choice. Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Well, I will get, try to give you one example of that. So the development of a substantial Christian doctrine of contract was not the fruit of a mere academic interest. Um, in the subject. Rather than defining themselves as theoreticians, the theologians and canonists in the 16th and 17th century were engaged in the practical business of solving cases of conscience related to the marketplace. And uh, what is um, uh, interesting also is to see that the jurists uh, at the time, the 16th and 17th century, we can see that in the Low Countries, they would often refer to the writings by the theologians uh, for the most, uh, let's say, detailed and um, yeah, most uh, accurate description of what was happening in the market. So um, uh, we can see that 
in the Low Countries, where we have uh, a whole treatise written by uh, a jurist called Zupaius on commercial law in the early 17th century. And at some point, uh, he says, well, but if you really want to understand this, you should read uh, the moral theologian, the Oracle of the Netherlands, Leonardus Lessius, because he, he was really in touch with the businessmen who were working in the Antwerp Stock Exchange. And so he describes in the most accurate way, actually, the new financial techniques. So the theologians were, were experts. They were not just uh, metaf metaphysical thinkers or something. They had empirical evidence. And this empirical evidence was designated by them with the Latin word experientia. And so experientia is also an argument that we very often find in their discussion of specific contract. They will say, okay, this is what we've learned from Thomas Aquinas, this is what we've read in Roman law and canon law, but uh, experientia docet, but our <laughs> observation of the marketplace shows that the businessmen are behaving in a completely different way. And here again, theology matters because for a Catholic theologian, if custom is widespread and is practiced by good Christians, then it has a normative value. Then you cannot just do away with it and say, well, this is what people are doing, but it goes against the gospel, so we have to condemn all these people. No. It's a fundamental, utter, different understanding of the normative value of custom. And this will be uh, one of the points of criticism that will be launched uh, towards these Roman Catholic uh, can lawyers and theologians by, uh, by Puritan jurists and theologians in the 17th century who will say, they will say, hey, wait a minute, Christ said I'm, I'm, I'm the way to the truth. He did not say I'm custom. So um, custom is, cannot be taken as a source of, of normative value. So if, even if the whole city um, practices usury, for instance, you cannot, you cannot therefore allow it, no. Then you have to be very, uh, very severe and strong as a moral theologian and condemn that practice. So again, different ty types of theology can have a very um, concrete um, effect on how um, you evaluate the normative character of certain market practices. But it was on account of their um, profound knowledge about the real uh, way functioning of the market that uh, Joseph Schumpeter, um, Joseph Schumpeter was an economist, huh? that Joseph Schumpeter uh, who wrote uh, a, a very influential work on the history of economic analysis, huh? published for the first time, first time in 1954 if I'm not mistaken, Joseph Schumpeter um, credited those early modern theologians uh, with the title of forefathers of modern economic science and he was referring to Luis de Molina and um, to Leonardo Lessius and Juan de Lugo in particular. And I think it's important to, to remember that the academic attention which has traditionally been given to the scholastic usury doctrine has obscured the fact that um, these theologians discussed many other types of contracts than money lending in the strict sense of the word. In reality, they discussed about bonds, about annuities, about credit sales, about foreign exchange transactions, about corporate financing, um, about dominant positions, about investment vehicles, and so on. And, and those subjects received much more attention than the whole debate uh, about usury. That is no longer uh, the framework that allows us to understand what they were saying about the marketplace. Um, if anything, as uh, Joel Kay has observed, uh, the early solidification of the church condemnation of usury had the effect of forcing scholastic moralists uh, to become experts in the ways of the marketplace and of citation. And so to illustrate the close connection between the turn towards a principle of contractual freedom and the practical solution of cases of conscience in the early modern marketplace, I will now try to uh, very briefly sketch you uh, their discussion of the legitimacy of a new investment vehicle, a new investment uh, technique, uh, corporate financing technique, you could say, that was very widespread in uh, 16th century Europe and the Americas, the so-called triple contract, the contractus trinus or contractus triplex. The triple contract, also called in Germany the 5% contract, was an intellectual construct actually to capture the following practice, a very simple practice that, that you are certainly familiar with yourself because that's the way how we invest our money today. Merchants would borrow money from investors for the sake of a business venture and they would promise uh, those investors, 
that they would return the invested money at the end of the project while also paying dividends on an annual basis. So this is like a way in which you can invest your money in a secure way as a private individual. And actually many of those investors were endowments and were charities, were church uh, congregations and so on. So they would know that uh, they could give money, lend money to a businessman uh, and that this businessman would on an annual basis give them a part of the profits and that at the end of the project they would get back the money that they invested in the first place. So a safe way of investing your money, that's basically what it came down to. So this is what they understood by the 5% contract or the triple contract. But it was, of course, problematic for traditionalists because this was like lending money at interest. It was like lending money at interest. So the theologians in the early modern period tried to reframe this practice in new legal terms to try to justify it. So how that did, did they do that? So to reinterpret this practice in legal terms and uh, justify it and make it uh, kind of uh, look not like uh, usury but like a normal profit, they said, well, actually, we have a combination here of three contracts. We have, first of all, a partnership contract, sokietas, uh, because we have the investor and the merchant who are both trying to uh, join up forces to well, launch a common project. For instance, um, we have a merchant who wants to invest in the spice trade with, <laughs> with the Indies. And there is um, Jesuit order, for instance, has a lot of money and they want to invest it. And they say, oh yeah, that's a good idea to invest in the spice trade. Um, so we, want, we go for this common project. We have a Sukitas. And then secondly, um, they conclude an insurance contract. So the businessmen, the spice traders, are going to insure the Jesuits and are going to insure the capital which they originally invested. They ask a price for they charge a price for that, of course. And then there is a third contract that is a sales contract. The sales contract through which through which the spice traders buy the right to have all the rest of the profits. So they say, look, we give you five percent that is for certain. But then we can take all the other profits. So if we make 30% profits, then 25% is for us. So the theologians would analyze um, this practice in terms of three contracts, a partnership contract, an insurance contract, and a sale purchase contract. And in this way, justify the practice. And the first time this happened was in Bologna in 1515 by Johannes Eck. Now, Johannes Eck, you might know him from another context, he was the main enemy of Martin Luther. Martin Luther, who considered that the Catholics were yeah, hypocrites somehow. And his uh, immediate, um, now also on the theological level, enemy was Johannes Eck. And Johannes Eck had been invited in 1515 by the biggest bankers uh, at, the, at the time, by the Fugger banking family from Augsburg, had been um, invited in Bologna to defend this practice. Of course, because that's how the figure, figures were making money. They were the bankers who invested in all these companies who went to the, to the Americas, uh, to, to Asia, to make lots of money. So for the figures, this was a matter of um, justifying their business model. And so Johannes Eck was the first in 1515 to uh, justify this practice. So a key step, actually, in justifying this practice was the breakthrough of freedom of contract. Freedom of contract, because the theologians could say, look, everybody is free to enter into three contracts at the same time. Even though this contract does not exist as such, for instance, in Roman law, there is no specific actio for this specific contract, we can nevertheless conclude these three contracts separately, separately between two and the same people, and then uh, enforce it, because it was the will of the parties to enter into these three contracts at the same time. So you see a very theoretical notion of liberty of contract suddenly has very uh, concrete effects, namely that you can justify a practice that previously was condemned. So I come to my conclusion. I think it's natural, of course, to take the law of one's own time and country as a norm and hence to consider it as normal. But as I've tried to show, if carried to excess, this tendency 
leads us to an impoverished understanding of the historical roots of Western contract law. To assess the morality of the marketplace, Christian theologians and lawyers in the Middle Ages and the early modern period were brought to bear their knowledge of virtue ethics in the Bible on commercial transactions and contract law. And as a result, over a period of more than five centuries, a detailed Christian doctrine of contracts was developed in commentaries on canon law texts and in voluminous treatises de justitia jure, de restitutione, etc. Imbued with the credo of 19th century legal positivism, a modern lawyer might not expect to find such an elaborate treatment of both general contract law and specific contracts in the writings of theologians and jurists belonging to the church. It may even come as a bigger surprise that their thought, influenced as it was by Aristotelian moral philosophy and evangelical principles, evolved towards a contract theory centered around the notions of freedom, autonomy, property, and individual will. For several reasons, this past engagement with contract doctrine may resemble a foreign country, a foreign country where people did things differently um, as the British novelist Leslie Poles Hartley famously uh, said. On the other hand, reading the scholastics expositions on the morality of promises um, and reading about their sensitivity to economic issues, a modern audience might be prompted to agree uh, with another writer, William Faulkner, who said that the past is not dead, it's not even past. Christian contract doctrine, as developed from the 12th through the 17th century showed a remarkable ability to accommodate the rise of individual autonomy and the entrepreneurial spirit. Moreover, within a Christian universe where man was essentially thought of as a social and religious being, it did not consider those values as incompatible with the principles of fair bargaining and evangelical charity. I thank you very much for your attention. And I don't know if there is space for questions. <laughs> I had, a, I had a quick question, um, which, was there any cross-pollination? Um, Onyata's writing in the middle of the 17th century, and by that time, some of the Grotian ideas had been out there. Um, some of what Grotius was writing and what others around him were writing, Thomas Hobbes and others, kind of made certain conclusions of Catholic moral theology safe amidst confessional wars, you know, made natural law safe for any, any human being, two human beings who found one another on the on the high seas, who didn't know anything but could communicate in signs, could begin legal relations that could also take on a, even a public law character eventually. Right? They could make a nation together. Now, that's being written, as you said, at, at the time when just the height and the conclusions in Nunyata and others of this long tradition are, are, are being formulated. Was there any inf informing? We know Grotius was informed by what was happening in other parts of Europe, but were they informed by what he and Thomas Hobbes and others were doing? Well, to a certain extent, um, I think they were aware of what Grotius was saying. Huh? So there was um, a mutual exchange, let's say, huh? because Oniate, so he publishes in 1646. Grotius' work had been out already since uh, 1625, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah. And so we can actually see citations of Grotius in Pedro de Oniate. So on the one hand, Grotius had been influenced by Cobarubias y Leiva or by, by Lesios and Molina, but then later on, later theologians uh, in the scholastic tradition were influenced by Grotius. Um, so they were certainly aware of one another, um, mm. even though, you know, in this polemical context, it was not always possible to acknowledge that openly. Um, but. Um, yeah, I mean, as Charlie Donahue has uh, once said, uh, he studied actually the way in which, for instance, um, the whole uh, thinking of these early modern classics on marriage law uh, had an impact on the subsequent legal tradition. And so actually he found that Robert, uh, Robert Joseph Potier, for instance, in the 18th century, was actually engaging in conversation with those early modern scholastics, but um, you can hardly see it from the references because he had to hide it somehow in, in this polemical context. But I don't think Hobbes uh, would have been acceptable for the early modern scholastics. That would have mm. been a bridge too far. Mm. But Grotius uh, definitely is uh, someone that they are familiar with. Yeah. Thank you. Is there a question from the audience? Can we have the first? Uh, yes, uh, Dominic Burbage. Thanks so much. 
a just point of clarification, when you say stoicism, you're talking about delayed gratification, for instance. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. It's a very interesting remark. There were a lot of elements, of course, in your uh, observations also about yeah, the role of um, labor and expenses in determining, determining market value. I could come back on that as well. Um, yeah, delayed gratification, that's perhaps uh, less ambiguous than, than stoicism. Yeah, is of course a very important notion. That's what Max Weber is um, studying also. Eh? So, um, delayed gratification as as uh, as as a kind of a source of um, the accumulation of wealth, because people also then do not uh, want to enjoy the riches which they have already accumulated, and so then capital grows and grows. So you have ever more capital that can then also be invested and so on. So that's definitely um, something to take into consideration. Um, yeah, so it was clearly a factor that contributed in Max Weber's eyes to the extremely adequate compatibility between the Protestant spirit and especially the Puritan uh, Protestant spirit and capitalism. Um, so how does that work with the Catholics? Yeah, it's a, it's a different theology, of course. Um, yeah, so for them, in theory, um, for instance, granting um, delay of payment and being more charitable, um, yeah, they, are, they have incentives to do that because that accumulates credit in the eyes of God somehow. Um, because then, yeah, they are literally accumulating merita, as they would call it, merits in the eyes of God. So they would hope for a reward then uh, in heaven. Um, yeah, so there are all kinds of interlinkages, I think, between, between ideas of salvation and spirituality and then the way in which they will evaluate uh, specific uh, behavior in the market, that, that's for sure. But it's, of course, very complicated and sometimes very hard to, to prove the, the relationship. But there is certainly correlation between all these ideas, yeah. Um, of course, the whole notion of risk was debated uh, as well in the 16th and 17th centuries, was still rather controversial. Uh, in the late Middle Ages, you, you still have a rather risk-averse culture that very much resembles also discussions which you now have in Islamic finance, uh, where risk is also, uh, somehow you have, to, you have to rely on divine providence. So how can you reconcile that with being prudent and trying to avoid risks yourself and trying to insure your, yourself against risks? It's, that's like a tri tricky relationship. <laughs> um, and you can see similar attitudes in the late medieval uh, tradition. Uh, but in the 16th century, um, I would say most uh, the Catholic theologians, at least that I've read, uh, they start to accept the idea that risk periculum um, is a fact of life against which you can ensure so that periculum has a pretium, has a price that can be evaluated, can, can be established in the market. So you are allowed to pay the price to um, yeah, prevent yourself, to uh, ensure your, yourself against certain risks. So very interesting notion of risk and, and the changes in it uh, for, for its own sake. Yeah. Then as far as your remark about Thomas Aquinas and um, expenses and labor concerns, so there is a notion, of course, in the early modern scholastic tradition that is different, I think, from radical uh, ultra-liberal <coughs> notions of, of the market today. And it is that indeed for them, uh, let's say the average costs and expenses that a merchant um, or a craftsman incurs should normally be reflected in the, in the just price, in, in the market price. But they make this very important distinction between the average costs and the average expenses and the expenses that a particular person incurs. And why is that necessary? Because, of course, they want to reward very prudent businessmen, and they want to punish uh, businessmen who are not, uh, not prudent. So if it normally takes, for instance, I don't know, uh, let's say, uh, say 1,000 pounds to ship uh, a car to the UK and sell it, uh, but you, as a very imprudent uh, businessman, you spend 5,000 pounds to ship that same car, uh, then according to the scholastics, you cannot kind of calculate that very high cost into the price you charge. That would not be a fair price. Uh, but 
you can still charge the normal average costs like of the 1,000 pounds, that would, that would be allowed according to this class because they have this notion that somehow yeah, labor and expenses must be taken into account but only the average costs and expenses and that is, that is again a way of, um, of a kind of rewarding prudent businessmen because if, if you were a businessman who had only incurred 500 pounds then that's great for you because then you have won 500 pounds uh, because you are allowed to make that uh, extra profit because other average businessmen they make more cost than you but you because of your intelligence or because of your prudence or because of all kind of investments you made you make less costs and expenses so that's good for you then that's a perfectly legitimate way of making profits so that's um, that's also a very important point in, in scholastic just pricing theory yes go, go ahead maybe maybe stand and tell us who you are and then ask your question Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, well, it, it, is a, it is of concern to them because prudentia is a virtue. Prudentia, prudence, is a virtue. It's like something that you need to practice to become a full man, literally a virtus, uh, to be a complete man that pleases God. You have, to, you have to live in a prudent way. And what is living in a prudent way for them, prudentia, is, you know, it's a very etymological meaning of prudentia. It's providentia, it's this capacity to anticipate to see before the others what is going to happen. And that is like a, an important quality that you can develop, that you can work on. And by studying hard, for instance, or by your experience, you will increase your capacity uh, to be prudent. Uh, so in this uh, sense of, yeah, uh, prudence in the Latin sense, in the, in the virtue ethics sense of the word. Yeah. Um, and that is of course important also because if you have been manifestly imprudent that is, that is actually also a fault, a culpa. So that, is, that, is a, that can even be a sin. Uh, for instance, if as a doctor um, you are going to um, do an operation, operate on, on someone, but you, I mean, you, you studied uh, 50 years ago and you have never updated your knowledge, then you are being imprudent. And then uh, if you do something wrong and the patient um, I mean, leaves the hospital with other uh, wounds or, or even dies because you have been uh, doing surgery on him, well then, this is, uh, you will be liable, you will be liable on the account of your imprudence. Um, and for the, for, the, for the Christian theologians, because of course already in the Roman legal tradition you have this whole uh, reflection on, on fault and, and culpa, but not necessarily in a Christian sense of culpa, but then for the Christians, their whole framework of sin will reinforce the importance of this notion of being prudent. And so because you are prudent, not committing, for instance, faults that lead to harm uh, for other people. So this notion of prudentia is a different notion, I think, than in many modern philosophers. Um, here it's really tied, uh, tied with their notion of prudentia as a virtue the phronesis of Aristotelian uh, ethics, actually. Probably time for one more question, and just as a point of information, after this is done, we need to be out of the chapel at uh, 25 past the hour, unless uh, anyone wants to stay for a sung evening prayer, which will last, that service lasts a half an hour. Is there one final question from the audience? Then I'll, I'll again use my right. Mr. Bunce, is that a question? No, okay. All right. So, um, what do you think today in an, er in an age where most persons engaging heavily in the market, we might describe them as, if not post Christian, maybe non Christian in their market transactions? And it would probably be rare to meet a confessor who was alert to these things as many of these late scholastics were. It, but is there, uh, if you were in an advisory capacity as, uh, as an historian of, of ideas, if you were recommending one of the, the virtues 
for the market that was brought forward by, by these, these thinkers, which would it, which would it be for, for us, for our, for our markets with our high levels of risk, with our you know, integrated and global uh, economy? Well, COVID has been a great interruption and a lot of it, and maybe it's taught us something, but is there one of the virtues that you think they were good at, maybe that we aren't as good at, or that we really should focus on? Well, that's a very good question, a very tough one, of course. Um, well, I think one of the things I learned, I think, by studying those uh, authors is that sometimes there is a risk of over-regulation, I think. But of course, it's the consequence of the fact that nobody shares the same worldview anymore. So then we get legislators who legislate uh, to try to control everything. Um, but that's counterproductive because sometimes um, it will lead to increasing the causes of the problem in the first place. Um, I mean, if you look at what happens, for instance, after the financial crisis or so on, so then politicians have to show that they react, so they create um, tons and tons of, um, of loss. But one of the consequences is that you can only survive as a businessman then or as a banker in this new world if you have a whole army of lawyers who are able to read all the laws and then implement them. And so, yeah, the wonderful thing here about the scholastics is that because they put more emphasis on individual responsibility, I think that's what those virtues uh, eventually come down to. That's another way in which you try to prevent all these excesses. Of course, as we've, it's not, it's not a, a rem, a, a, a final remedy either, but at least I think those others, um, they show us that, yeah, also working on the own character of people, I mean, it is important that people take their own responsibility uh, because you can also then, in, in this environment in which we try to regulate everything through laws, you, you get, yeah, behavior, um, speculative behavior with the regulatory framework, so. Mm. But it's, of course, not a, a very tough question. I couldn't answer it <laughs> entirely. But yeah, what I've learned from these guys is that, um, I mean, individual responsibility is, is also important. Mm. Uh, and that is something that is very difficult, of course, to enforce in the modern marketplace. Mm. Thank you so much for this lecture, for informing us of this, and for joining us. And we'll give a, give a hand for this. We have another recollection lecture on Wednesday, which, uh, which uh, Reverend Tronet will give on Max Turian as uh, the ecumenical vision of Max Turian, uh, uh, whom you might know from Taze, anyone who's been involved with that. So we, we, have a, we have a bifecta this week of recollection lectures. Thank you for starting our term off so well and for joining us. And uh, for those who are joining us digitally, thank you as well. And we'll see you all on Wednesday. Father George, did I miss anything or is that? And you're more than welcome to stay for sung evening prayer, which will begin in five minutes.